Hello everybody. We're going to look at a couple of choice questions from previous Gauss maths challenge, maths contest uh, problems. So the reason I'm looking at these is not necessarily because they're the hardest, but because they're the ones that I think that we can learn the most from. So the first one is a question from a few years ago, I think in 2020, and it concerns the sum of three positive integers and then it asks you what their sum might be. Now the sum of consecutive integers can always be written this way n, n plus 1, n plus 3 even if we don't know what n is. We add them all up, sorry not n plus 3, n plus 2. We add them all up and we get 3n and 1 plus 2 is 3. Now you notice something quite interesting here. It can be factorized. That means three must be a factor. Okay? It doesn't always work exactly this way that the sum of n consecutive integers is divisible by, uh, by n, although often it is the case. So anyway, when you look at the, uh, the options, there are several different options, but only one of them, 21, is a multiple of three. So you can solve this. If you want to get good at this, because this is a technique that comes up quite a lot, they like asking questions about consecutive integers, sometimes dividing them by something, sometimes multiplying them by something, sometimes finding common factors with something else. I really recommend you take the time just to practice uh, adding, adding them up and see if you, you get the pattern. So the sum of the first, the first one is just n, the sum of the first two is 2n plus 1, that's not hugely interesting. Sum of the first three, oh, we just did that. That is divisible by three. Now let's try the sum of the first four. You get 4n plus six. This is divisible by two, but not by four. Let's try the sum of the first five. It, of course, is divisible by 5. In this case, it's 5 and 10. And you can go on and on. I should highlight the fact that these numbers here are going to be triangular numbers. Okay. These are, um, this is going to be a triangular number sequence. If you understand triangular numbers, then you'll be able to see the pattern. You'll be able to see why it factors. I'm not going to go into it in this video. That you should become very very comfortable with summing, um, summing consecutive numbers. I will show you one other trick with summing consecutive numbers. Sometimes, sometimes it's not the best idea actually to call the very first number n. You and I can't give you a specific example, but Sorry, if you can hear that in the background, that's uh, that's my mother-in-law playing with my playing with my daughter. Anyway, um, sometimes we can call the middle number itself n. Like, let's say we want to add up the first uh, five consecutive numbers. Uh, we want to add up five consecutive numbers. You might actually want to call the middle number n. You want to call this one n minus one, n minus two. This one becomes m plus 1, m plus 2. So as opposed to starting at n, you actually put the middle one. Stop and think about why this might be useful. Pause the video if you want to have a moment to think. Okay, now let's go. When you add all these together, the plus 1 and the minus 1, and the minus 2 and the plus 2 cancel out, and you just end up with 5n. So sometimes the sum of n consecutive integers is just uh, n times whatever the middle number is. All right, that's a really, really cool little technique that pops up now and again, and it can save you a lot of working. So play around with, with adding them up. You could also try adding up consecutive odd integers, uh, consecutive even integers, things like that. Okay, and there's just another problem we're going to, uh, we're going to look at now. So it's about the positive divisors of a number. You might know these as factors. So while some places they're called positive divisors, some, some people call them something different. The idea is that they are the integers that something else can be divided by. 
So there's a problem where we are told that a number has eight divisors, eight positive divisors, and we're given some of them. In this case, we're told they are 14, 21, the number itself, and one, of course, everything's divisible by one. And it's your job to work them out. Now, you have to be a bit of a detective here. You actually have got more than it seems. If something's divisible by 14, it must also be divisible by 2, and it must also be divisible by 7. Everything that's in the 2 times table, sorry, everything that's in the 14 times table is in the 2 times table. Everything that's in the 14 times table is also in the 7 times table. So we know it can be divided by 2 and by 7. Likewise, if something is in the 21 times table, it's also divisible by any of the factors of 21. These, namely, are 3 and 7. Now, we've already got 7, but we've got 3. Now, something interesting happens down this end. Okay, so we've gone from here down to some lower ones. But if something's in the 2 times table and the 3 times table, it must also be in the 6 times table. So we've got quite a lot out of that. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, eight factors. Therefore, we found all of them. Um, and we can also determine that this last number, of course, must be 42. All right? Um, so I really suggest that you just play around with this. Um, you can just set yourself a little challenge. You can just come up with, I don't know, like two, two integers. Don't make them too big. Don't make them too small. Um, you know, you can just start with two that are quite close to each other, for example. Uh, if something is divisible by 24 and 26, what can you work out about it? Well, it must be divisible by 4. It must also divi be divisible by 13. Of course, it's divisible by 1, divisible by 12. And you can work these things out and you get really, really used to it. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a really, really good little exercise. I would like to give you a word of warning. Okay, um, so actually going back to the original problem, so they ask you to find all these uh, all these factors, which you might put in the, the, the hard work to do. What was it? 17, 40, 21, and 42. But notice, if you read the question carefully, they ask you actually for the sum of it. This is a classic problem that's a uh, mistake that students make because they do all of the hard work. They calculate these beautifully, and then they either forget to or they mess up the sum. Okay, whenever you're doing a quick sum, you might not think you have time to do the whole column addition. I understand that. So try to break it up into chunks. Okay, 1 add 2 add 3 is 6. 6 add 6 is just 12. Um, 7 add 14 itself is 21, which goes along with 21. Uh, and then they make 42. That's 42. 42 add 42 is 84. Add 12 is 96 which is one of the answers. All right, um, so try to approach this systematically. Even when you think that this is very, very easy, don't lose sight of the goal, which is to get as many marks as possible. Okay, and we're just going to look at one last problem now, which is about digits and products. There are many, many problems in these, uh, in these math challenges. They love to do things with digits, it's a good test of your ability to do things systematically. So we're told that there is a three-digit number. So when we have a three-digit number, often it's useful just to write it as like three, three squares or something, have some, some good way of thinking about it, picturing it. And we're told that the product of their digits is 36. So let's think about what this means. If something's a digit, the biggest it can possibly be is nine and the smallest it can possibly be is zero. So that really, really limits it. So now we need three of these that will multiply together to make 36. Now, there's quite a few combinations. You've probably already thought of some, but I think the most important thing with these problems is you need to have a system to be able to count through them. Now, there's many, many, many different ways of having a system, but I find the easiest one is to start high and go low or go low and start high. What do I mean by this? Okay, well, we, we need two numbers. We need three digits that multiply together to make 36. So we could think 9 times 4 times 1. Okay, why have I started with 9? Well, look, the highest digit is, is 9. Okay, and the next one will be 4, and this will have to be uh, 1. Now, we're still going to try and keep this as high as possible. What's the next lowest number this could be? It could be 9 and 2 and 2. Now, 
what's the next smallest uh, factor of, um, of 36? It's a digit, well it would be 6. So then you have 6 times 6 times 1. And then you have 6 times 3 times 2. Now what's the next smallest digit? It would be 4 times 3 times 3. And then you can't go any lower than this. So you see, not only have I been able to list them, I've also become very, very confident that these represent all of them. Now, these will be our combinations of digits. So we could have 9, 4, and 1. That would make like 941. Or we could put like a 419. That's one of the examples I gave in the question. And we could do quite a few. I can't be bothered to write them out you should not be bothered and you do not have time to write these out. We need a quicker way of writing these out. And we need a quicker way of counting them without writing them, I should say. So how do we do this? This is something I would recommend you just recommend, as you, you just remember. If you have three elements and they're all different, there are six ways of arranging them. I leave that as to you as an exercise if you want to work it out. If we have three things but two of them are the same, there are just three ways of arranging them. Here, once again, we've got six, six, and one, two of them are the same. There's just three ways of arranging them. Here, we've got three distinct things, six, three, and two, so there must be six ways of arranging them. And here, we've got four, three, and three. There's just three ways of arranging them. Add all these up, what do you get? You get 21, which is the answer. All right? Maths is not about memorization. You should be trying to understand things. However, there are some things which you just use so often in mathematics, it is best just to memorize them. I can think of some good examples, square numbers, of course, square numbers. Um, everyone knows what squaring means in mathematics, you know, it just means multiplying a number by itself. However, the square numbers come up so often that if someone says, you know, what's five squared, you should just know it's 25. You shouldn't need to do, oh, five times five or whatever, right? There are some things that you should just memorize in mathematics because their quick recall is often the difference between success and failure. Um, it allows you to see things. So for example, let's just, uh, let's just go through this once again. If you have three things, there are six ways of arranging them. There are six ways of arranging three things that are distinct. If two of them are the same, like A, B, B, you will see there's only three ways of arranging them. Yeah? Memorize these, they turn up all the time, and this is how you're supposed to solve a lot of these Gauss problems that involve counting the number of ways of doing things. If you find yourself writing out you know, more than a handful of things, that's usually an indicator that uh, you're doing too much work and you need to use one of these shortcuts. All right, good luck everybody.